Hello and uh, welcome. I hope uh, you've been able to log in successfully. I'm aware that Zoom has uh, done some uh, updates overnight, so there might be a little bit of a delay with some people joining us. So we're going to make a start um, and it's really uh, good to have you with us. Um, what we're aiming to do today is to give you some confidence and food for thought as we think about the ways in which we need to reimagine church for these uh, strangest of times. Um, we're going to be bringing you wisdom from fresh expressions from over 20 years of experience of that. Um, but I would just like to say at the beginning that we're aware that for a lot of people, it's a, a very busy and quite stressful time. And perhaps you're feeling under pressure to be doing creative things when actually you feel like you're using most of your energy, just keeping afloat. And so we want to just say at the beginning, we hear you, we understand that. And hopefully today might just give you a little bit of food for thought for the times when you perhaps feel like you've got a bit more headspace to reflect. But for those of you who perhaps are feeling a little bit more um, energised and, and creative, then you're absolutely in the right place. So our format for today is going to be that um, we're going to open with um, an, a prayer liturgy that's been written by a pioneer, Mark Berry, uh, for us uh, just for today. Um, and then we're going to be in a conversation with um, uh, three other pioneers who are going to be talking about what we're noticing about the current context and, um, and sharing wisdom and experience uh, from our, our learning over the past uh, couple of decades. Um, then we're going to hear from some digital pioneers uh, via a video, pre-recorded video, um, who are going to be sharing uh, their experiences of um, doing church online for a long time. Then we're moving into a section of questions and opinions. It's not question and answers, not Q&A, because um, to quip uh, Nadia Boltzweber, we don't have the answers, but we do have lots of opinions. So you'll be hearing from the pioneers again who are live with us today, um, sharing their opinions during that section. And then we'll move back to uh, Mark who will have written for us a, a, a liturgy in response to what we've been talking about here and how we've been, um, uh, how we've been discussing things. So um, that's the, the outcome uh, of today. So in our question and opinion section, we're gonna be needing your questions. And so we're asking for you to begin that right away or as soon as you think of a question. So if something strikes you during the conversation or um, something you've brought with you today already wanting to uh, find out about, then um, please put them in the Q and A section. Um, if you've been using uh, webinars with other, uh, other people, you might have used the raised hand feature, but just to say today, we're not using that feature. So it's just put, typing your questions into the Q&A section. And it's also worth saying at the beginning that all the slides, all the links that we talk about, the liturgies and of course the recording of the webinar itself and actually a bonus video um, uh, will be available to you who've registered for the webinar and um, you can expect the link in, in the next few days. So I'm going to now hand over to Mark, who is going to open for us in prayer. Hello all. I'm going to start really with a, a reflection. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about lament in the situation that we're in. Uh, and in our search for meaning, we can be tempted to look for cheap and easy answers. But lament teaches us that there are indeed things that we don't understand. Uh, in fact, things we can't understand. And at times we can do no more than speak our confusion to God. And lament tells us that we should do no less. So uh, we're going to start with a, a reflection, which is a mixture of some of my poetry uh, and some quotes and reflections from Walter Brueggemann from his book, The Prophetic Imagination. Jesus knew what we non ones must always learn again, that weeping must be real because endings are real and that weeping permits newness. His weeping permits the kingdom to come. Such weeping is radical criticism, a fearful dismantling because it means the end of all machismo. Weeping is something kings rarely do without losing their thrones. Yet the loss of thrones is precisely what is called for in radical criticism. I wait for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning, 
more than watchmen wait for the morning. My feet are sore, too long standing, too long waiting for change, for direction, for a road. Heels scoring thin grooves, shifting loose grit, exposing the ancient solid, chasing the hard cracks to unexpected places. Long time baked brittle, resistant to gentle softening, but friable, daring a stamp to shatter. Still waiting, not risking the blow, not sure what lies beneath, what might be revealed, wrapped in roots of whatever grows, whatever we allow to grow. My feet are sore, too long standing, too long balancing the options foot to foot, toe to toe, feeling the blow, the punch, the slap, facing the challenge, uncomfortable on my soles. Curling, rolling, bending, in anticipation, in waiting, to stand unmovable in my place, as the air moves around me singing, pushing and provoking. My feet are sore, too long standing. I'm still waiting, waiting for myself, waiting. I feel I should be moving, stirring the earth into new ways, painting fresh paths with my momentum, but I fear the cracking ground. I fear the hardness and its brittle future. I fear the roots that rise and twist and catch me. I fear me. My feet are sore, too long standing. Only those who embrace the reality of death will receive the new life. Implicit in his statement is that those who do not mourn will not be comforted, and those that do not face the endings will not receive the beginnings. I wait for the Lord, more than the watchmen wait for the morning, more than the watchmen wait for the morning. Sitting in the deepest dark, the competing lights begin to fade. For months they've blinded me, they've spun and flashed to distract me. They've teased me with their glamour, calling like the sirens, but they were not my lights. They beckon nonetheless, too often I've reached for them, not wanting to miss out on the fun, not wanting to be left outside. They look so beguiling, a dancing spectrum of life, but they were not my lights. They promised me good times, told me they'd help me to forget. They promised me a new start, offered me security, identity, an illusion of importance, seeking to seduce me, but they were not my lights. Sitting in the deepest dark, my eyes began to open. I saw others sitting there, and in the stillness we drew in. We spoke in empty silence of the lights that tempted, but they were not our lights. And as we looked together in the dark and told each painful story, with only grace in common, we faced the empty space. The smallest spark was kindled, and my spirit began to wonder if this could be my light. The prophet engages in futuring fantasy. The prophet does not ask if the vision can be implemented, for questions of implementation are of no consequence until the vision can be imagined. The imagination must come before the implementation. I wait for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. And so we wait. Um, just to recap, in case any of you have experienced any problems getting onto the webinar this morning, uh, this afternoon, I mean, um, we are going to be um, uh, get opening into a conversation next, but we'd love you to be sending in your questions for our questions and opinions section at the end. So do uh, get them coming in as soon as you think of them and uh, enable uh, our team who are busy compiling the questions to, to bring them into theme so that we can tackle them together um, after, the, uh, after the conversation and the video. Um, and just to remind you, just put those in the text through the Q&A section and everything will be sent out to you uh, afterwards. So uh, researchers have been looking at uh, digital church and uh, the ways that people have been doing church online for um, studying this for over a decade. And Tim Hutchins, who's a researcher, was, um, uh, was struck by how at the beginning of that time when digital church began to be a thing, there was um, some people were putting church online. 
that is they were doing what they would almost uh, normally have done in, in a physically gathered way. They were putting out content and broadcasting. And he described that as church online. And then there were others who were being more experimental and uh, were thinking about the context of what it's like to interact online. And that that was, uh, that he, he coined that term um, online church. And that's always really interesting to me because as pioneers, um, what we're thinking about is the context. We're always trying to uh, understand and listen. And that's the place that we start for any new initiative when we're trying to reimagine what church might look like in that particular context. So I'm interested to think a little bit about what the context of this time and the, the constraints and there's also the opportunities uh, might lend uh, us at this time of, of trying to uh, think about doing church differently. And um, another researcher, Heidi Campbell, was as also noted in her research with people that are interacting mainly online for church. Um, all of uh, the interviews that she carried out, there were these very strong themes of these traits that people valued. And um, the first one was a sense of relationship that it was wasn't simply a place to share information and notice board, but it was a space to, to allow them to form that network, that social connections. The second thing people valued was care, that the space could be a place to offer care and to receive care for themselves and encouragement. The third uh, uh, trait was to be valued, to feel like they, their contribution mattered, that their voice mattered, that they could hear, be heard and, uh, um, and that they had a presence in that community. The fourth was about connection, that idea that you can connect across the world, across time. You don't all have to be uh, in the same place at the same time to have that, those relationships. And then finally, it was about the intimacy of con uh, communications, that people wanted to be themselves, a place to be themselves and to communicate really with others. So we're going to use those two ideas to shape our thinking in this conversation, starting with what we're noticing about the context at the moment, and then thinking about how we might enable um, the, uh, to create spaces that, that bring out those, um, those traits that we've just uh, uh, noticed. So it seems like a good time to bring in our conversation partners. Um, they're going to introduce themselves and then they're going to uh, share just a little bit of um, how they've got to be here and, and um, why they have some things to share. Um, so share a little bit of their stories with us as we begin. So um, welcome to uh, Johnny, Johnny Baker, um, to Sue Wallace and to Paul Bradbury. Good to see you. Hi, afternoon. Hello, hi. So, um, Johnny, how about you start and kick us off with uh, an introduction to yourself? Hi, yeah, I think the, the connection for me with this conversation began in youth ministry. Um, I was working for Youth for Christ and there were lots of young people we were connecting with in schools and uh, in detached work. But getting them to join church as it was proved very challenging. And the thing that helped me was stories of cross-cultural mission. So finding out that when people went to other cultures and tried to do the English thing, it didn't work as well as when they grew church in the, the local culture where they were. So that we started trying to do that with young people. Fast forward a, a, a decade, I realised I had the same challenge with my adult friends a lot of them found a cultural gap between their world and church at the time and um, so I, I connected then with what back then was called alternative worship which was particularly I guess engaging with um, the chill out end of club culture or something postmodernism and all of that it was very probably very pretentious but I loved it <laughs> um, and I'm part of a community now Grace that, that's been going 26 years that came out of that so that was if you like chapter two of the question around mission and culture and then the, the third thing for me has been connecting with pioneers and actually the wider church I suppose catching up to that with fresh expressions and so on and thinking actually there are all sorts of people however well we do church who we're not going to reach the way we do it so we need fresh expressions of church we need to go into multiple contexts and do that so the thing I do now I work for the church mission society I have done somewhat embarrassingly for nearly 20 years clearly I like it um but the thing I do there is train pioneer uh, ministers, mainly lay, some ordained, who are on that adventure of uh, reaching out beyond the edges of the church to share Christ, to share faith and transform communities, which, and I absolutely love it. Brilliant. Great. Well, it's great to have you here. And, uh, and now, Sue, maybe you can introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose like Johnny, um, 
I um, had various um, experiments in, in different cultures. I started off um, in 1989, ages ago, last millennium, uh, with a group called Visions, which um, we were exploring club culture and nighttime culture in York, and we used to go and do club visuals, and we also started a multimedia worship service. Um, I was in that group for 18 years or so. Um, I got ordained and trained part-time along the way, uh, ordained in 2006, and then ended up having a similar journey in York Minster, starting a service called Transcendence there, which reached out to the tourists and the spiritual seekers in the heart of York. Um, and then in 2010, I moved to Leeds and um, did something similar. I was invited to take a post, which was part presenter, partly liturgist and singer, at Leeds Minster and also partly to reach out in and start fresh expressions in Leeds City Centre and as a result of that I ended up in Winchester in 2014 as presenter of the cathedral. Um, then in 2019 I, I left that to become um, a liturgist and a creative worship consultant for the Transcendence Trust which we founded back when we started those services in York to be able to be a bit more freer to help other people in their journey of creating worship that fits their own, their own culture. So in a way it's almost come full circle because now with um, uh, lockdown being in place, I'm now being invited back into Visions services too, uh, where they're having Zoom meetings and creative compline and that sort of thing online. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's been an interesting journey really, very varied in some ways, but similar tactics along the way, meeting whichever culture it is where they are. Mm, great, thanks Sue. And then uh, Paul, how about you introduce yourself, uh, yourself to everyone? Thanks Heather. Um, yeah, I mean, similar really to Johnny and Sue, I think my journey started with, um, with this, particularly in curacy. Um, so I was in a, a fairly normal, as it were, uh, parish church in Southampton and uh, really found myself constantly asking the question how what I was involved with on a Sunday morning and through occasional offices was going to engage with, with folk um, who I was connecting with through the school run and in other sort of networks and finding a significant kind of cultural gap between the two really. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, had a generous training incumbent who allowed me to experiment with all sorts of things. So we, we did an exhibition in a disused chemist shop that was, I suppose for me, my first attempt to, to bridge that gap. Uh, using a creative way of expressing the gospel and at the end of that curacy came to the conclusion that parish ministry wasn't wasn't really where I was at wasn't really where I was called and um, I've been in pool now for 12 years as a pioneer minister and um, <clears throat> we started a missional community called reconnect and uh, another community called space for life and now a, a charity that oversees that with a bishop's mission order called called missional communities and that oversees a, a whole bunch of pioneering and fresh expressions work but you know continuing to ask that question how we bridge the cultural gap um, okay. and you know creatively reimaginatively express the gospel and church for, a, for a, a host of different cultures. Great well thanks all and I guess when we were thinking about uh, about today we were talking about the things we're noticing um, in the shift that we're all experiencing in the you know the dramatic change from from the pre-lockdown to to now and also the the un uncertainty about what's ahead of us but we we kind of picked up on a few things uh, that we'd know we'd been noticing so the first that we we talked about was kind of anonymity so I wonder if you want to uh, uh, Sue, perhaps, or someone come in on, on what we've noticed about anonymity. Mm. I think one of the strong things about cathedrals is that uh, one of the people, reasons spiritual seekers are drawn to cathedrals is that they can hide behind a pillar. They don't get immediately pounced on to join the coffee rotor. And the interesting thing about these online spaces is we've create, recreated those pillars. So you can actually dip into somebody's worship service anonymously and explore faith without feeling threatened in any way or that you have to sign up for anything and I think that's one of the beauty uh, of online worship really um, that it enables that to happen spectatorship mm. before worship mm. Mm. Uh, it's interesting to think that um, of the traits that people were, were talking about, about online church, that kind of sense of connectivity was really important. But of course, that, that you need to take the steps into that, don't you? I think we're also noticing some, some sort of latent spirituality around uh, it, um, in the culture. Yeah, I mean, if I can pick up on the connectivity, mm. I mean, it's almost so obvious that we don't notice it. But I think one of the significant things about 
the the internet and smartphones and so on is that everyone just assumes they can be connected all the time when i say everyone most people yeah. um so i i think in terms of church and god and theology that's an exciting shift because i think young people grow up just assuming you're connected all the time so the idea of church or gathering once a week um that feels really odd uh, so so the fact that we're in lockdown i think for people who who experience connectivity there, there's that sense of connection through whatsapp through facebook through instagram whatever it is that they follow and the flows that they jump on and actually sometimes the content that is being put out on services so i think a good example is that blessing video that we've probably all seen a few times or whatever but you know the question is where did you notice that where did you see that i bet mm. it wasn't in the church service first of all because a friend had tweeted it in your whatsapp group probably so many people had re-sent it to you that you were sick of it but the point <laughs> is, is that 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 sense of flow and connection all the time so yeah. so for me that co connectivity in terms of faith and the body of christ the network of christ is really exciting i mean it was there before but i think mm. we, we all notice it more now mm. Mm. And in the online um worship the watch parties people don't just want to watch something they want to watch something with other people yes that's mm. right isn't it mm. Mm. i mean we were, I mean, this latent spirituality, is, as Johnny touched, has been has been there for a long time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, when I first came to Paul, um, I did some some listening and ended up being an activist, wanting to do something a bit more concentrated, and did some research with people who didn't go to church, and that latent spirituality was very clearly there then. But um, the other thing, and I think this is relevant now, that was that was picked up from the conversations I had was how 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 important it was for people to sort of maintain an independence to their spiritual journey so i think in the same way that uh, zoom or or you know streaming services provides that sort of anonymity it also provides that kind of i'm, I'm in control of this you know like like sue said you're not going to get pounced on um but that only but that's a, that's a that is a that is a great thing but it's also a challenge isn't it in mm. terms of the the communal dimension of the christian faith mm, mm. i was uh, hearing somebody say the other day about that you know it's if we don't get the western consumerism separated from our spirituality we're going to end up with that real pick we could end up with a real pick and mix so how how do you think you've been um, observing or, or seeing other pioneers or doing it yourself connecting people who are perhaps going it, dipping their toe in the water as it were and, and into more of a community well, I think the, the stats that people, you know, I saw something this morning, funnily enough, are suggesting that, you know, one in four people have dipped their toe into visiting something online. So clearly that is happening in all sorts of places. And, um, you know, I, I think we're really noticing that now. But one of the interesting things, I think, in terms of just sharing life is uh, I mean, I noticed this because I blog, I got an Instagram, Twitter and whatever, and I... I put stuff related to my photography group, the latest elderflower cordial recipe or whatever it is <laughs> I've made, and and the you know latest liturgy about the resurrection of Christ that I've written. So there's a kind of visibility of the mm. flow of that stuff that people notice who are interested in photography, you know, which is one of my interests. So you know mm. they they will then pick up on that and talk about that. So I think I think there's just a lot that people can see and notice. Um, mm anonymously how how people jump into anything beyond that's an interesting question if they do and if indeed they want to mm, mm. yeah and i don't okay. know if i like at your end but the nhs clapping for the yeah. cameras that's been really interesting and around where we are it's almost become like an act of corporate music making which feels very worshipful with people over the road playing the oboe and the saxophone and percussion and wow. bells and drums and it's an amazing spiritual moment actually once a week yeah. um, so that's been happening too as we've become more distanced from people it's it's almost like we're reaching out more as well yeah I think the local has become important in such a different way, hasn't it? Yeah. I think um, one of the fears that I heard a bit at the beginning of, of lockdown was, well, it, it was the point of me streaming from St. Bart's when actually they can go to Holy Trinity Brompton, they could go to Tim Keller's church in the States. But what actually we found from the, from the data is actually that people aren't doing that. They want something more local, which I think is really fascinating. 
Mm. Yeah, and, and I, you know, for me that chimes with the other kind of um, thing that I'm noticing is that the sort of, um, you know, the, in, certainly in my street, but, you know, that's repeated in lots of other people's streets that I've come across, you know, there's sort of blossoming of community. So this sort of latent desire for community um, and this sort of sadness that that's, that's disappeared over the last generation or two. And this is an opportunity to rekindle it. Um, you know, so, so picking up on those two things together, somehow it's about making that connection between the digital world and the local embodied world. You know, and, and Johnny, Johnny's touched on that already, and we're we're certainly finding that. You know, that I can I can say that I've I've got a blog about with some reflections on this whole time, and people who I'm connecting with on WhatsApp through the street neighbourhood groups. Oh, why don't you put that on? And and then it then there's this sort of blend of the mm. uh, the digital and 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 the local. Mm. But I, I think that's the critical point that the. Paul is making that he's already connected with the neighborhood as an yeah. instinct so I think that's where pioneers are really great and I find them completely inspiring I mean in some ways I think quite a lot of pioneers are loving this lockdown because they they've they've already got community connections because that's their habit and then they find themselves positioned in ways that mm -hmm. you know they're, they're the ones coordinating and joining in distribution of food parcels or you know organizing a concert on their street or you know all these neighborhood connections or you know the simple thing of setting up whatsapp groups for various streets in the neighborhood mm -hmm. so in mm -hmm. Earlsfield I know the guys there were involved in that with others it wasn't solely a church thing it's a community thing but I think you know I've noticed that pioneers are in a way are well positioned because they already have those mm. neighborhood connections now there's no reason why every parish church and minister in the country shouldn't have those connections can't make those connections I mean mm. it's even in the declaration for deacons and for priests that that mm. is part of the calling and the role you know so yeah yeah uh, and for and I think for many clergy they will have really deep connections yeah. with though sometimes that might have been more in real life than digital and sometimes that will be that the, the, the kind of online being forced online has kind of taken uh, some of the, uh, you know, some of us a bit of a time to adjust to, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So, what is it about enabling spaces then going forward? What are your thoughts about uh, ways that we can enable space for those connections of, uh, of of different parts of our lives to to bump into the Christian faith and to experience it, not just to know about it, but to experience it. I don't need to view it as a pressurised thing. I think it probably is happening naturally as people are swapping phone numbers and chatting over the fence and everything and it just sort of slips out sometimes mm. and, and and therefore pe people make that connection that they've seen somebody helping somebody or they've seen the candle in the window early on in lockdown we had that candle in the window thing and I thought oh that person over there must be a Christian because they've put a candle up in their window too and then making that connection between that and the things people are doing in their community is mm. quite um Quite exciting really because I think we can feel pressure that we ought to be I don't know Mother Teresa going out and doing everything and solving all the world's problems whereas actually we just need to make ourselves available and mm. take advantage of the opportunities really mm. um, do what I think one of the pressures of being online is you feel like you've got to do what they're doing like oh they do this fantastic stream service and they've got a zoom coffee afterwards and all this other uh, social work happening as well I can't do that I don't know how to do it but do what you can do mm, mm. Uh, often those other people have different giftings and to use those giftings, whatever they may be, if mm. it's gardening, for example, just get out there and garden and then share the produce. Mm. Yeah. Now, um, Anne Morrissey uses a phrase called apt liturgy, which is the, the notion that you're, uh, you're, that the liturgy means something really uh, significant for now and connects with people's language and culture. Um, so uh, have we got any, uh, you know, examples of other people or yourselves kind of using writing stuff? We've obviously got Mark doing that today for us, but that sense of kind of how do we connect with that sense of spirituality? One of the things I've noticed happening is um, a lot more togetherness in the planning of liturgy, almost through um, necessity, really, but with different, it's very like um, in Corinthians, with one person bringing a tongue and another person bringing a hymn, one person's bringing the prayers, another person's bringing a piece of music, and then it's all getting stitched together by somebody. Mm. And, and that feels so beautifully corporate. Mm. Yeah, lovely. And Johnny, what were you going to say? 
I, I was going to talk about the home. Um, I, I think we're all at home. So, we, you know, we're living lives in quite small worlds and then we're on online and we can connect with a big wide world as it were. But I've quite enjoyed people whose instinct has been to make available resources for people at home. Mm. So <clears throat> an example of that would be Paul Bradbury. He could say something about that. But um, <laughs> Al Barrett in Hodge Hill, I like what they did around Easter. They just made available resources for the Easter vigil and so on. And people could download them and use them at home. And then when they gathered, they could talk about what they'd done and so on. So I've, I, I've liked that. Um, mm. There was someone I saw on Facebook who'd made 30 little cards for, for prayers that were prayer over coffee, prayer in the bathroom, prayer while you're gardening. Um, it's, you know, I think that sort of thing's really helpful because it's saying actually we're at home and, oh yeah, the Christian faith began in people's homes. Yeah. So maybe that, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Yeah. 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 And we, we've, I mean, our instinct as a, as a community, you know, an important principle for us is participation. Um, and so when it came to the lockdown and uh, there was this immediate rush to to church online as you as you put it earlier it seems to me anyway it just didn't feel right to us so we sort of took a couple of weeks to kind of reflect and and get ourselves into an into a new kind of paradigm and um, yeah I mean as Joy saying what, what we've essentially done is given people a, a bunch of resources at the beginning of the week with a with a text with a text from the bible for people to reflect on and we've actually taken two weeks to reflect on that text so do do it on two sundays mm. uh, so there's something about it going a bit more slowly um and and then using zoom um so we meet for a meal on sunday obviously in our separate houses and then meet for a zoom uh, call afterwards and the the quality of listening and the quality of the reflections and the breadth and, and depth of insight into the passages that we've been reading, which are, you know, the, the passages around the resurrection and Pentecost, um, well, this Sunday, anyway, have been, have been, you know, remarkable, truly remarkable. And um, I think it's, it's created a, a more genuine level of participation from everybody in the community, you know, to a great extent that, than we've ever managed, really. So mm. it's been a revelation. And that's a really brilliant example of actually the pressure not being on the leader. It's actually a shared thing and that that's not just a, a relief in terms of, of, of pressures of leadership, but actually a beautiful way to invite a deeper community, a deepening of understanding and a deepening of, of reflection. I think that's really, it's really inspiring, actually. And I think... Um, uh, the, the, the idea about gathering in those different ways. I love the fact that you're all munching as you as you uh, are on Zoom. I think that's fab. You know, you don't have to kind of be all pristine and, and kind of ready. And, you know, I love that. I think that's a really that informality seems to like mm. seems to me as something that's really beautiful in that. Yeah, the, the mute, the mute function is quite helpful in that regard, isn't it? <laughs> While you're chewing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, something else I was thinking about in terms of kind of the, the ways that we might be able to help people uh, pray when they've not prayed before or, or kind of, you know, enter into some thinking about the Bible when they've not done that before. Um, I was thinking about how actually as clergy, many people are, are putting together funeral services or wedding services or baptisms. And it's, it's, a, um, it's a real art to do that well. And so many clergy do that beautifully, kind of weaving in the family's life story, their experiences, the things that mattered to them. And I think in a sense, it's sort of that that's a really good example of apt liturgy and a way that we can we can draw on uh draw on those kind of skills really yeah i mean i, I like mark's um liturgy at the start you know he picked up on the themes of grief which is obviously very real for a lot of people and you know i realize i'm saying pioneers are loving this they're probably not all loving it but certainly not everyone's loving it so grief leading to newness but the other thing that he picked up on there was imagination and i think you know it's easy to think that in the current environment what you need is slick technology and a studio and whatever else but actually that the, the critical thing i think that people need is imagination mm. and that that whether it's the crafting of artful liturgy or whether it's thinking about how you engage with the neighborhood, which I'm always going to push that one, um, even though I like the other, I think both require imagination. So mm. again, I saw Rachel Summers who had posted um, 
a John O'Donoghue blessing that she'd sort of chalked in the queuing place for, I don't know if it was Sainsbury's, but one of the supermarkets where she was. That, that seemed to me to be like a bit of apt um, mm. liturgy. You know, it was a poetic, beautiful thing written in chalk on the pavement while you're queuing. So I think, you know, but, but it's about imagination. All she needed was a bit of chalk, but imagination. Mm, mm. yeah brilliant and I know that we could go on talking for a, a long time um but I'm just aware of the time and so what I'm going to do is draw our conversation to a close right now but you will of course be on the line and uh, back in for our questions and opinions so you've got plenty more time to uh, start your uh, to share your opinions later so thanks all for now. For those of you who may have uh, had some trouble joining us at the beginning, just to recap that we've got a questions and opinions section coming up in a little while. And uh, do keep sending your questions in. I can see them coming in, but keep on sending them in via the uh, Q&A uh, section. And we will share all of the uh, slides and the links and, that people have shared in our conversation and the liturgies that Mark's doing for us and all sorts of different things uh, will be uh, available over the next uh, few days. And you'll be sent the link. So now we're going to actually uh, go to a video and um, uh, when it, it occurred to me that fresh expressions um, have always been set up uh, as a way to connect those who um, can't really connect with the mainstream church or wouldn't ordinarily be able to do so and and that's because in a sense church either wouldn't make sense to them in their culture or their life experiences or perhaps there were other barriers and um, there are, of course, lots of people for whom physical gathering in a space presents a lot of problems uh, for access, those of, uh, with disability or chronic uh, illness. And so for them, online church has been a lifeline for many, many years. And it struck me in the first uh, week of few weeks of lockdown that the mainstream church was suddenly scrabbling around for how to do church online. Uh, and that we probably would have been a bit better off asking those who've been doing it for a while instead of reinventing the wheel. So I set up lots of conversations with pioneers in that digital space and some of them have uh, since videoed themselves talking about uh, their experiences and although not everyone I spoke to um, is in the video they've all sh helped shape my thinking and, um, and I would hope to share a little bit more from them uh, over the coming weeks. So we're just going to see the video now uh, of our online pioneers. Hello, I am Katie Tupling, co-founder of Disability and Jesus, the online task force mainly found on Twitter, and also a disability advisor and lead chaplain amongst deaf people. Hi, my name's Emma Major. I'm a licensed lay pioneer minister. I am a blind wheelchair user and I've been online for 15 years, but uh, enjoying online church, worshipping God for the last three, three or more. My name is Bill Bravener. I am a vicar in Stockton-on-Tees in the Diocese of Durham and also the Bishop's Disability Advisor for the Diocese. Hello, I'm Pam Smith. I'm the priest in charge of iChurch, which is the Diocese of Oxford's online church. And I don't have a vicarage. I'm not set up for home recording. So I have quite a lot of sympathy with people who are being thrust into this for the first time at the moment. Hello, my name is Laura and I am the founder and director of You Belong, an organisation set up to support people with chronic illness and disability online and connect the online and offline church. I was inspired to create this organisation through my own experience of chronic illness and the disconnect between myself and the church community. When I started You Belong, I very quickly realised that I was one of many people trying to do a similar thing creating a community, discipling, evangelising and resourcing and equipping the church to be more accessible. Many church leaders have found themselves thrown in at the deep end, so to speak, and feel under immense pressure, which is completely understandable considering the suddenness and dramaticness of this situation. When I was a curate, I thought like a curate, I spoke like a curate, I acted like a curate. Then I became an incumbent and realised what a pain in the ass I'd been. Curates arrive very enthusiastic and full of questions, and some think they know better than their incumbents. Those churches who are coming online for the first time are full of curacy enthusiasm, questions everywhere, and lots of advice to those who are already there. The incumbents, 
the Indigenous people who've been online for quite some time have to have a certain amount of patience and resilience, like the training incumbent, to welcome these new ideas and enthusiasm and to gently remind that some have trodden the path already. It's not better or worse, it's just about relationship and learning. Avoid the possibility of colonising when the Indigenous people can already tell you the lie of the land. A lot of people have been doing online church for quite a long time and they've been doing it quietly and in a fairly unsung way. We also know quite a lot about the pitfalls and we know quite a lot about what people expect and what people may get wrong. So please um, discover for yourselves what it means to do it for you. But please don't ignore what's already been going on. I am passionate about the church. Christians and those exploring faith gathering together to worship God, learn more about him and do everyday life together. Church is church, whether online or offline. Neither is better than the other. We need both. Something that I have heard again and again during this lockdown period, physical church is one thing, online church is a different thing. Online isn't real and physical church is real. Between the physically gathered and not physically but still gathered church. Online church is as real as any other. What matters is that people want to worship God and be in fellowship with each other. So let's celebrate that. Some bigger churches have been doing online services for a while now and sharing expertly produced music, photos and videos, which is great, but it won't keep people engaged for long. And I don't feel it can be classed as church as it lacks the community aspect, which is key. People can dip their toes into the water without necessarily having to be very public about it. Having a think about, is that something I want to be part of? One of the positives of online church is that anyone can see the posts you are posting without you knowing. This is great because it enables people who are exploring faith for the first time to see these things without family or friends knowing and to do so in the comfort and privacy of their own home. I used the example of the first time I went to KFC and I didn't have a clue what was on the menu or how to order. And actually, it would have been much easier for me if I could have sat back and watched people anonymously and picked up some clues about what you did. Not having to know how to go on, not having to know how to participate. Many of us have found it much more positive to be in church online and have found a community with God there. If I am someone who has ME or CFS or just having a rubbish day with arthritis, I don't necessarily find myself able to go to a place of physical presence. So what online gives me is the choice of joining in when I can. Online means that I can join a pilgrim of people who are coming in when they're ready and they're able to. Online and offline both have their merits, but online gives me choices that offline doesn't allow. It's much easier to encourage people to develop their own ministry and using the term Church of England's used in the last few years, setting God's people free becomes so much more accessible online. Speaking to individuals one-to-one -one and in small groups and discussing the small and big things, the good and the bad, the faith and the mainstream, and getting to know one another is what builds community and also what keeps people engaging. And the ways in which we can encourage everybody to be far better connected, both online and offline, than we ever were before. I often hear that people aren't themselves online. Well, that might have been the case many, many years ago, but it isn't the case for most people now. I have an online friendship group that is more than 15 years old. We're from all over the world. Many of us have met up and we know more about each other than many of our physically present friends know. I'm realising now that I have to let people think what they want to think and just be me because it enables a deeper connection and opportunity for genuine relationships and these grow to lead to community. Without being who we are and opening up to each other, community cannot be formed. Mainstream church is inaccessible to some people. Uh, buildings are sometimes difficult to get into. Words, liturgies are sometimes difficult to understand. Sometimes it's simply that the attitudes are wrong, that the welcome isn't right, that there are other things that make 
church just impossible. Of course, it's worth saying, online church is only more accessible if it's made that way. Words on the screen are still invisible if you can't see them. Speaking is still silent if you're deaf. Zoom can be intrusive and anxiety raising or even confusing. Accessibility needs to be something that's thought about no matter where you are putting on a service, where you want to worship, where you want to meet with other people. We need to value the things that everyone can share and offer and help develop and nurture them. Their gifts and voice are important too. We keep hearing about the new normal. Well, the new normal will be even more of a mixed economy of church than church ever was before the pandemic. Some people will exit lockdown at great speed and never want to be online in worship again. Some of us will be shielding for many months still to come and online will be the only form of church for us. Some will have enjoyed online church and will want a pick and mix type in, um, situation. Stay with our online ministry for the long haul, nurturing people in their Christian journey. This is a marathon, not a sprint. But bearing in mind 2.2 million people in this country are on the extremely vulnerable list and should be shielding beyond any kind of lockdown lifting. That's a huge amount of people who simply can't get to your brilliant alpha meal that you're going to hold back in buildings again. They won't be able to come to the invitation to harvest and to Christmas. So why not put in place the things that are now online and sustainable? Those people are going to need you when the buildings reopen and they simply can't get there. When lockdown is over and church buildings start to open again, we mustn't stop doing and being the online church too. And of course there'll be lots of people for whom the world for quite some time to come is going to require some kind of physical distancing in order to be safe. And all that means is that there are more people who are going to experience the way of being that's been the case for lots of disabled people and vulnerable people for a long time. Some people rely on it. Even if church buildings at services offline were fully accessible, there will be people too unwell to attend on a Sunday and who don't feel included and understood in a physical church in the same way that they can do online. There are people both online and offline who are lonely and are in need of community and church. Both groups are important. What we need to have into the future is really what we need to have now. What we go back to isn't going to be the same as what we had before because we'll have learned so much. Different ways of being together, different ways of gathering, different ways of journeying together as God's people. If you're new to online church and accessibility, please speak to some of us who have done it before. There's nothing about us without us. As we uh, come in now to our time of questions and opinions, I'd like to invite Johnny and um, Sue and Paul back and, um, uh, and actually then James, who uh, works for my team, um, is going to be uh, coming in with the sort of um, questions that have been coming in. Um, he's going to be like the Graham to my Scylla, um, or for those who are a bit younger, maybe a bit more like Ian Sterling coming in over Love Island. So um, uh, James, have you got some questions for us? question so I'll try and represent those thematically and put these to the panel. The first question, a number of people have reflected that we're having to change very quickly but we also need to listen as well. So how in the experience of our panelists today have they managed to effectively listen to what's happening in their contexts whilst also being sufficiently agile to move quickly to change and adapt? Mm, great question, thank you. Um, Paul, would you like to come in on that from your experiences and, and those other pioneers you know? Um, well, yeah, absolutely. Listen, listening has been key to what we've done and, it, and is the sort of, you know, the, 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 the very beginning of pioneering is, is listening. Um, 
Uh, that, it's a real challenge, isn't it? I mean, the question is, to, uh, and yet to remain agile and change quickly, because I think there's something about the pioneer journey that has advocated and learnt um, something about going more slowly, mm. and uh, that listening takes time, and to resist the temptation to 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 make um, you know to move into activity or to move into projects too quickly. Um, and it's interesting, I. Th- I mean, yes, there is, there is something about this, the, the, the situation of lockdown that, that clearly did uh, invite us to, 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 to need to move quickly. But I still wonder to what extent uh, we were shaped by our culture of moving so fast and that, that, that uh, mm. we didn't slow down enough, as you were sort of uh, implying about, you know, listening to those who've done online church for a while. We didn't slow down that we might have made more different decisions or better decisions. I don't know, but for me, there's something about the pace of listening that is inherently a little slower than the world around us. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm thinking of a, a pioneer I know on an um, outer estate and who um, just left some ribbon for people to tie on a tree if they wanted to kind of say a prayer and she just, you know, made a little cardboard sign or whatever. And it even in that process what she found was that she didn't she had no idea that many people passed by that way so it was another way of listening it was like a pragmatic way to listen rather than just doing the actual you know talking it was it was noticing through actual offering something and then seeing what the response was a question i've often found really useful to help me when i'm planning whatever it is i'm doing is what will lead this particular group of people what will help them Um, into the presence of God Mm. and the answer can be so completely different depending on the context but it really helps me sort of focus my listening and focus what I might do in response to that really Mm. Mm. great thank you and uh, another question James yeah next up some people have been raising concerns about future tensions between those who will want to continue worshipping online and those who won't or indeed can't. Mm. So how might a church work towards achieving that sense of belonging across the two groups Mm. when, you know, let's face it, the anonymous nature of online worship might appear to be at loggerheads with that traditional understanding of community? Mm. Yeah, another good question. I think it's about the mixed economy, isn't it? That's that we should be quite good at that, but I'm not sure we are yet. So any, any thoughts, people? Yeah. I mean, I could share something from the world of education. I mean, obviously uh, we run out all sorts of training and we've had to jump that training online pretty fast. And we've been talking about it for a long time, knowing it's a good idea to get that in the mix, but uh, coronavirus has been a good provocation to get that done. And actually, surprise, surprise, it's going pretty well. Um, but in, in education, when, when that happens, what, what people talk about is blended learning. You know, that you, face-to-face is really valuable. Um, and the, the online is really valuable and for, for different reasons. So probably the ideal is some kind of blend. So I, I think a lot of communities, um, and I, yeah, I'm sure we'll think about this in training too, we'll think about not one or the other, but what's mm. the kind of mix. And as Sue was saying, every community is different. I don't think there needs to be pressure in this kind of way, but I think there is real opportunity. Um, you know, and the, one of the things we've discovered in Grace through being online is lots of people that were part of Grace who are now in Denver or York or wherever it is, are landing in, or Devon are landing in our community and feeling connected to it again. So for us to not continue something of that would be mm. a shame, you know, because we've learned some things. So yeah, for, for me, I think, how, how do you do blended? Mm, that's a good question. I don't know if anyone else has got the answer <laughs> or an opinion. I wonder if the answer lies in coffee, actually. I remember way back in the early 90s when St. Michael's was diversifying into very different styles, like St. Michael Belfry in York. There was a family service and there was a band-led evening service and there was an envisions later on at night. And we were having discussions about how do we connect these diverse groups with one another? Mm-hmm. It seems the same question. And the answer seemed to me to be in shared experiences like coffee. Mm. The eating together and meeting together is what creates community. And so those kind of Zoom online coffee forums are amazing for connecting people in many different ways. So I wonder Mm. if the answer is in something that does that, that Mm. connections beyond 
stylistic issues to actually sharing people mm. and, um, and that community connection, talking to one another and mm. listening. Yeah, I mean, I, if I can come out, I mean, I agree. I think, I think we've had a sort of slightly more institutional way of understanding, you know, being together. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder whether, you know, this is forcing us to think, you know, in some ways, those who've been doing online church for so long have been struggling with the, with the issue of, you know, the mixed economy and how to feel part of the wider church. And now it kind of feels like it's the other way around. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, to what extent a sort of a more diverse way of understanding the the wholeness of the body of Christ and and not seeing it in institutional terms and more more of a more of an ecology mm. uh, and lots of different kinds of relationships uh, lots of networks um, rather than a kind of sort of more hierarchical understanding of what it means to be the church together. Mm. Yeah, great. Thank I mean, you. In the days of alternative worship, there was an emphasis on provisionality and flexibility and experimentation. And, and temporary icons, things which would shift from week to week, and some things would work. We keep the ones we didn't. We've been, and it's been really interesting seeing this this new landscape. That exactly those tactics are, are happening really quite naturally. Uh, but understanding that provisionality and not being scared mm. that I have to do it perfectly first time, because you don't actually. We're all learning through yeah. a new landscape. Mm, great. James, another question. Yeah, a couple of more practical questions. I'll say them both and you can point them off in directions. The first relates to Holy Communion. We'll try and avoid a theological minefield here, but Holy Communion, how can we best offer this from home? That's the first question. And second question, which is better, live streamed services or pre-recorded services put out as live? Hmm. Uh, in terms of the last one, Johnny, do you want to talk a bit about the flipped learning that you have uh, have been thinking about recently? Um, yeah, I'm not sure how that... Uh... Okay, I'll, I'll tip yeah. you off then. I was going to say it was something about um, uh, uh, one of the ways that you have been delivering some of your stuff is to value the time of interaction uh, online yeah. by giving people the, uh, the stuff to read ahead of time, things yeah. to reflect on. A bit like you said as well, Paul, in your community, like giving people the passage to reflect on. So it's some, something about valuing the time when you're actually uh, able to interact and, and using other means like broadcast, like, uh, yeah. you know, sending out stuff. That was where I was going with that. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah. So, so the flip learning idea again comes from education and we, we're using this online at the moment and it got me thinking, what does flip church look like? And flip learning is basically where you make your content available so people can look at it beforehand. And then when you meet, you can talk about that and discuss that. So you use it for kind of what's valuable to do for a group. Mm. So I think there are loads of possibilities for that in terms of, we, and that is not, that's neither live streams nor pre-recorded. Um, and the technology you use lends itself to different things. So probably Instagram live, Facebook live, YouTube uh, live are all, all recorded, are all performative things where the mm. community participation is just in comments. Whereas I think Zoom, Google Hangout and things like that lend themselves more to community interaction. You can put people in groups and so on. So mm. I think the technology does affect what you do. But I think our instinct in, in Grace is, yeah, we're more focused around community, but we're quite small. So, that, so there's also an issue of size, I think, mm. that relates to this, where, where you know, if you're a, a big a church every you know every town city's got one or two really big churches you know they're much more going to instinctively go down a broadcast route with bands performing and so on mm. it'll be good and people that go to those churches will enjoy the quality of that kind of thing but if you're medium sized or small i think there's such a lot of opportunity around mm. thinking not uh, if I can yeah, change the question, not live streamed or pre-recorded, you might use both of those, but to use a phrase from the internet from about 2006, we used to say community is the content. Mm. So, you know, how, how can you make community when, when you gather in that way? I mean, obviously it's some mix of all of those. I mean, the, the beautiful thing about content is because we're online, if I want to go and listen to a discussion with 
Tom Wright on his theory on Paul, I can go and listen to Nomad podcast interview with him and find out about that. I don't need to, someone to preach. We can just tell people to listen to that and then talk about it. So there's loads of content already there. We don't yeah. even have to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, yeah. different things will work from different, for different people. For some people, having an active spiritual communion online will be their thing. For others, going for a service of the word will be their thing. Mm. And various other varieties of thing. And it's sort of, again, it's listening to their heartbeats and listening to the heartbeat of God and trying to work out what, which way to go forward for our, our community, the people we're working mm. and living and praying together with, what works best for them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think communion is a particular issue of pain for quite a lot of people, mm. whether it's at the heart of their sacramental theology and life and they can't share that, that feels extremely painful, or yeah. people are frustrated and angry because they feel like the church is saying they can't have communion at home. So I think there's a lot of pain around that at the moment. I mean, mm. my solution to that is to just, when you share bread and wine in your home, just don't call it an Anglican communion and you're fine. You know, I mean, so that, that's, uh, and Christianity has gathered around the table for centuries um, and began in homes. So it makes sense, but just avoid the rubric altogether. Just don't do an Anglican communion, but just share bread and wine. That's my hot tip. <laughs> and on that note, I think we're running out of time, unfortunately, and I'm sure we could um, have got into some more juicy conversations uh, from that jumping off point. I recognise that we haven't had a chance to, uh, to touch on many of your questions, but um, we do realise that and we are going to keep them. We're going to look at them and they will hopefully uh, guide what we put out in the future in terms of the, um, uh, the, the, the items that we discuss and the people we might bring in. So this is the first of a conversations. Uh, first start in a conversation rather than the end of it so I do hope that um, you have found that uh, some thought-provoking and some uh, and hopefully some helpful stuff to get your imaginations going so at this point I'm going to hand uh, back over to Mark uh, who will have uh, hopefully written us a liturgy uh, in order to, to sum up and to bring together all of those thoughts uh, in order to offer them in prayer so over to Mark just be still for a moment. The night is passing, a new day will dawn. In the sound of sheer silence, uncomfortable silence, stilted silence, painful silence, mournful silence, stir and spark our imaginations beyond safe return. The night is passing, a new day will dawn. God who ransomed the people from captivity and led them to freedom into the promised land, becoming a people of promise, deliver us from the darkness of isolation and fear. God who led the people first through the dry and barren desert, allow us to be the first fruits of creativity of new and fertile life and culture, of imagination. The night is passing, a new day will dawn. Open our ears to the cries of the disconnected, the struggling and the grieving, to emerging language, discovered community and fledgling culture. Open our eyes to notice, to see the simple connections that are finding fragile ways to flow, human to human, human to earth, human and divine. Open our hearts to each other in the smallness of home and in the vastness of the digital world. May there be new ways of being, reconnections and connections, diverse and exciting new energy of relationship. The night is passing, a new day will dawn. Grant us in the way that is to come, a radical unity that flows from raw love and grace, that challenges power, the arrogance of the colonist and the fear of imperfection. As the new day dawns, may we discover and share together in the spreading light of your healing and the fresh dew of your blessing. 
the night is passing, a new day will dawn. Thank you, Mark. And, um, and as I said at the beginning, the, uh, the liturgies that uh, were written for today will be available in the link that you'll be sent. Um, I'm aware that there was a big theme in the questions that we didn't get to um, and so uh, we are aware that there's a, a people asking for what uh, what resources might be available both um, digitally and uh, and uh, printed for helping think about the start of this journey um, into uh, pioneering and, and fresh expressions and that's brilliant that's exactly um, what we would hope that that this hour will have done is to kind of whet your appetite for that um, I guess there are some different things um, um, if you're in a diocese, find out whether you have a, a mission enabler or a fresh expressions enabler um, and, and get in touch with them because they will have uh, some resources, either stuff they've produced themselves or stuff that they've used locally and that they might be able to connect you with other people locally who are also grappling with that. We've got a national project called Greenhouse, which is about cultivating new fresh expressions and, and bringing people together who are doing fresh expressions in order to strengthen them uh, and, and share the wisdom and, uh, and make good, um, good choices about how to keep growing and, and keep going. So um, ask if your diocese is part of Greenhouse, that might be a possibility uh, where, uh, where you are. And if not, we are thinking about ways that we might be able to deliver um, those kind of learning communities online. So uh, watch this space as far as that's concerned. As Johnny said, in terms of um, the community being the content, it's really good to try and connect up. So there's some Facebook groups. Um, Johnny's blog is a good place to go to to find out uh, some uh, more different spaces and the CMS uh, um, Pioneer uh, Facebook site. There's all sorts of different things. The content's out there. My boss, I'm going to mention, um, a guy called Dave Mayle, has written a book called How to Pioneer, even if you haven't a clue. And there's also a workbook out now. So um, there are lots of ways that you can get um, uh, get stuck in and start to find out more. There's also the um, ecumenical website, freshexpressions.org. UK and that is um, a place where they're also putting out some content and um, you'll see lots of, uh, of really helpful stuff there. You can download an app from the App Store um, called Godsend which is a, a way of, um, of sharing faith and growing new Christian communities. So there's all sorts of stuff out there and we'll put some links to those things in, uh, the, uh, in the content that you receive um, as uh, you've um, uh, as you've signed up for here. And just to draw your attention as well to um, our next uh, webinar, which is drawing on the wisdom of fresh expressions, along with the wisdom of my colleague Sandra Miller and her work, which has been into how people make first contact with the church through occasional offices or uh, and, um, and it, through the physical gathered church, but also as a, from a fresh expressions point of view, how people come into contact with the church and maybe bump into it who wouldn't ordinarily bump into it. So that's on the 18th of June and the uh, link is the same one uh, where you will have signed up for this uh, webinar so it's um, the short link there at the bottom of your screen and again that link will be in um, all of our uh, all of the stuff that we send out so as we're coming to a close I just want to thank Johnny and Sue Paul and Mark and also all the digital pioneers all that remains for me to say is um, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed. Do give us some feedback. Do let us know via our social medias and um, different places. And um, we look forward to joining you, uh, you joining us again uh, at another time when we'll be uh, looking to develop some of the thinking and, um, and keep this conversation going. Goodbye. <laughs>